Well, welcome everyone. My name is Emily Hinsey and I'm the Director of Programs for Grantmakers in Aging and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Grantmakers in Aging is a national membership organization that serves as a network and resource for funders and a champion for aging related issues and investments. With over 110 members, GIA works to mobilize the social, intellectual and financial capital required to improve the experience of aging now and in the future. Today's webinar is presented in partnership with our Aging and Technology Funders community, which was launched earlier this year for funders who are exploring, initiating, or currently funding technology solutions to improve the experience of aging. I want to acknowledge the supporters of this community as well as today's webinar, which include the Consumer Technology Association Foundation, Next 50 Initiative, and RRF Foundation for Aging. I'm now pleased to introduce you to Kimberly Harris, who is serving as a subject matter expert for this community, as well as moderating today's webinar. Kimberly brings extensive experience in the intersection of aging and technology, having worked at the Older Adults Technology Services, or OATS, for many years as the Director of Strategic Development. And prior to her role there, Kimberly ran an inter international intergenerational program for a decade. So Kim, it's really great to have you and I will turn it over to you now. Thanks, Kim. Uh, Emily, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you, Emily. Um, and thank you, GIA and the Aging and Technology Funders Steering Committee for making today possible. I also wanted to share uh, that each program you'll hear from today has been supported by one or more of GIA's member organizations. So I want to extend a heartfelt thanks to the funders that are involved in making those programs possible. I'm thrilled to showcase them here today. As Emily mentioned, this topic is very close to my heart. Uh, exactly 20 years ago, I realize now, I got involved in an intergenerational international program that connected European high school students to Holocaust survivors all over the world. When it started, we didn't even have internet connections in the schools, and you can imagine that the encounters didn't happen over Zoom. But over the years, that gradually started to change, and I could see the way technology began to fundamentally enable and enhance the conversations between students survivors, teachers, and generations of family members, many of which continue to this day. There are three important things I learned from that experience that I wanna share with you today to frame this conversation. One, that young people care so much more about making genuine connections to older people than most people ever give them credit for. Two, older people can be extremely determined to learn to use any type of technology in any way if it allows them to connect with a younger friend. And finally, it takes a remarkable amount of effort and structure to enable participants in intergenerational programs to have the freedom to create truly meaningful connections that have mutual benefit, especially when technology is involved. So today you're going to hear from three of my favorite programs so they can share with you what they've learned along the way. Each represents a different approach to intergenerational work that incorporates technology but they have different configurations, work with different populations, and do it in a variety of settings and geographies. You'll see that each has created unique and powerful programs and partnerships and figured out ways to demonstrate measurable and often magical outcomes. So we'll spend the first half of our time today hearing from representatives from each program, and then we'll switch gears and invite you to the conversation. So please use the question box function uh, to send along any questions or thoughts you have and want to share along the way, and we'll be responding to them as a panel after the presentations. Next slide, please. Each program you'll hear from has one thing in common. They all employ many of the best practices when it comes to program design, implementation, evaluation, and innovation. First, you'll get to hear from folks involved in the Digital Connecting Corp a collaboration between two universities in Michigan that supports digital skill building for older adults in their communities. Later on, you'll hear from Chris Lemon from the Ann Arbor Community Foundation, who will tell you why he was an original champion and funder and remains the number one cheerleader for that program. 
Next, you'll hear from DeRote, a nonprofit based in New York, who will present about how they are incorporating technology training into their decades long history of supporting intergenerational friendships and creating spaces that spark social connections across generations. Finally, you'll hear from Linkages, a unique collaborative of organizations implementing intergenerational programs and working together to share expertise, solve challenges, and raise the bar in important ways. And you'll also hear what they're developing in order to have a collaborative digital space to build organizational and intergenerational connections. Please remember to note any questions for the panelists in the question box. We'll reserve the second half of the webinar for hopefully a very lively conversation, and we want you all involved. Next slide. So without further ado, here are Tyler Calhoun and Dr. Alicia Jones from the Digital Connection Corp to tell you about their program. Next slide. Hello, everyone. Tyler Calhoun here. I'm going to get us started, and then I will pass the baton to our faculty champion, Dr. Jones, um, who will share a little bit more information about the program. All right. If you want to go to the next slide, please. Oh, back just a bit. Um, if you could go to the first slide for the DCC section of the presentation. I'm not sure if it's changing on y'all's screen, but it looks like it's the same on mine. I'm going to get started, though. So the Digital Connecting Core is a program that is focused on um, digital connection for older adults in the Washtenaw County of Michigan. And so we focus on digital technology access and digital tech training. And so through that, we um, provide digital devices, Chromebook laptops, low cost devices to individuals in our community who are 55 and above. And um, also we focus on folks who are considered low income. So folks who might not be able to get access to a device like this on their own. Oh, there we go. There's our name. Um, so we are providing laptops, Chromebook laptops to folks um, through our program. And but we're not just giving them a device and saying, all right, have fun. We are providing training also through weekly classes um, at the Ypsilanti Senior Center, which is one of the partner senior centers that we work with for this program. Um, like they introduced the program, we are a collaboration between Eastern Michigan University and the University of Michigan, which really allows us to expand our reach. Um, so we operate out of three different senior centers, the Ipsy Senior Center, like I said, but we also operate out of the Chelsea Senior Center and the Milan Senior Center as well. Um, U of M has some transportation resources that we don't have at Eastern that they can provide to the tech coaches that work at U of M. And we have students that serve as the tech coaches, right? So that's the intergenerational component to this. And these students come from a wide variety of different programs. So at Eastern, we kind of focus on the occupational therapy program and getting students from that program to serve as tech coaches. And then at U of M, we've had students that have come from social work um, and engineering and other areas as well that have served as tech coaches. Um. <laughs> See tech challenges, we roll with it. We we just figure out how to make it work. That's what we do, okay? And honestly, we do a lot of that in our weekly workshops as well. Um, I think one of the best things about a program like this is it demands flexibility. Um, we have participants of all ages. So like I said, we focus on starting from 55 and up, but we have people that regularly come who are, you know, 89 plus. And that's one of the things we um, we have to recognize in a program like this is the flexibility that it requires to deal with um, different different ages, different generations, so, and to work with them in ways that they can um, feel supported and encouraged to learn something new that might seem challenging at first. Um, and so one of the things that we really try to focus on with this program is building relationships with the people that we are serving. So before we actually meet the people in person at a workshop, we do a call with them to kind of explain what the program is like, see you know, what they're interested in and see if this is something that they'd wanna even participate in. And if so, we get them added to our uh, wait list. And so once the wait list is ready to, um, 
or once we're ready actually to recruit for a new cohort, we'll go through that wait list and we'll do an intake call with um, the people that are on the wait list. And so we'll get some more specific and detailed information. We'll share some more detailed information about the program with them. And then we'll give them the information that they need to join us either a week or so after that call. And so before we've actually met these people in person, we've already met with them twice. They've heard about the program. So we're starting to initiate and establish that relationship at the onset. And then that just continues once they start to meet and work with the students and work with each other in the program as well. Um, one of the great things that I don't think we realized going into this program is how much it could help with social isolation. Um, and so the people that come to the program are oftentimes friends with each other, neighbors, family members. And so they'll give each other rides or they'll know each other and they'll be excited to see each other, you know, for that once a week class and get to connect with each other. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we work with the program. And we just finished up our pilot year. We're going into our second year of operations. And so at this point, I would love to pass the baton over to Dr. Jones to talk a little bit about some of our findings, the research that we're doing with the program, and some other things as well. So Dr. Jones, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Tyler. So our program, when we originally started, um, we. The original idea actually was to try to pro provide that one-to-one -one training. And we ended up getting an influx of individuals who wanted to join the program. So we started and transitioned into a more classroom style model. And so now what we do is we run it almost like on a semester style basis. And so we start at the begin, beginning of a semester. So like right now we started in around September and we'll end this particular cohort in December. And it's approximately 12 weeks. And so we do weekly training at the Ypsilanti Senior Center and it's a group classroom style model. And so for two weeks, we will the students rather will do a teaching session on a particular topic. And so that particular topic has been things like laptop basics. It has been um, how to download Google Photos, how to use Canva. This semester we added how to do Shutterfly and send those photos to like Walgreens or places like that. We've done grocery apps, just to name a few. And so we keep the same topic two weeks in a row then we move into the third week, which is open question day. That particular day, it does give that one-to-one -one piece because the individuals from the community and in our program, they can come in and they can ask any question that they need assistance with. Sometimes uh, a, mo a very popular uh, topic that we have came across is getting those passwords. How do I get this password for this particular site? And so we did create some materials for them to make that easier as well. Thus far, as of October 2022, we have served 231 individuals across the Washtenaw community and the Washtenaw County community. We've distributed 87 devices to those individuals. And as Tyler said, we distribute that device and we teach you how to use it. And so our students were very integral in this program where the lesson that they teach, we also put it on a Google Drive. So when you enter into that program, you get access to that Google Drive and you get to keep it. And in the Google Drive, you have your, your lesson that was in the class. And you also have that lesson that is, um, that is saved and is voiced over. So if there's a piece that you, you know, didn't remember or you needed to go back to, that same lesson has a voiceover. So these are some of our images just from the classes to give you guys a visual. Um, it, it's a fun time. We, we love, like everyone looks forward to Tuesdays. And these are some of our students as well as you see Tyler in that top corner. And so this just gives you kind of some insight on the structure and the setup. That picture in the middle, that is, um, we do we do our lessons on a projector screen. So that is the screen where the students will teach the particular lesson and they'll course through it on the screen. So there's a visual attached. And throughout the lesson, we have approximately, at the Ypsilanti Senior Center, we have approximately 
five to six students who are on the team. So one person is primarily doing the step-by-step -step lesson piece. And then another, the other students are walking around and make sure that everybody is on pace. Uh, you can go to the next screen. So some things we also found in this particular program is that we noticed that the, the older adults were actually stating that, you know, having this technology piece has really improved their overall quality of life. It's not only improved um, that idea of social isolation, but we found that they are less anxious when it comes to using technology. They're less fearful and some other things that they feel like they're more independent. They don't have to get on the phone and, and call younger family members to try to teach them how to do certain things on their phones and their computers. And so we were seeing that they're more excited about using technology. And this program also allowed for us to have that intergenerational piece because the students from U of M as well as, um, as, well as Eastern Michigan, they're able to enhance those pieces of how they can work with the older adult population within their respective fields because this gives them a learning opportunity that and it helps to reduce those stereotypes that the younger generation had about older adults as well as the older adults had about the younger generation and so we were able to see that we're starting to break down those barriers we also were able to speak at um, a couple statewide conferences and so it's nice to get that word out and moving forward we do plan to continue this particular program. We, our semester technically for 2022 ends December 6th and we'll start right back up in January, right after the holiday. And it'll start a 12 week session as well. Some of our classes are standard and set as in laptop and phone basics, um, getting started with Google because Google is a more primary user for for like internet and, and just those those other forms of media. And so those particular classes are those like set classes, but we do a collaboration with each particular cohort. We have, we have those conversations that, what do you want to learn? Because we don't dictate what we're teaching. We're giving you the basics, but we're also providing an opportunity for you to learn what you want in order for to keep that meaningful piece. And so, Moving forward, we're really excited to um, keep this program going. And at this time, I am going to turn it over back over to Kim. Thank you so much. Um, we're back on the right slide again. Thank you for everyone for putting up with the technology and GIA for sorting it out just in time for me to introduce DeRote. Um, for nearly five decades, DeRote has brought generations together through programs and services that build social connections. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Ellen, the Senior Program Officer for Community-Based Programs and External Affairs at DeRote, to tell you about their programs, how they've started to incorporate technology, what they've learned along the way, and what they think lies ahead. Thank you. Ellen, the next slide, please. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, Kim and I have a long history as a, of uh, New Yorkers um, and we've worked together. Um, so it was just lovely to be here and so excited to be able to share uh, DeRoad's Tech Coaching Program with this um, audience. Um, you can go to the next slide. So DROAT is a, we are uh, about to celebrate our 50th anniversary in uh, another year. Our mission is uh, to alleviate social isolation and uh, foster intergenerational relationships. And um, technology is certainly a natural to do that type of work. Um, in 2018, we created DROAT's Connect Through Tech Department. Uh, the mission of that work is to leverage technology to facilitate social connections and enable older adults to access the services and resources they need for independent and socially connected aging. Um, we know that the research shows us that access to technology can effectively reduce social isolation. So being 
uh, evidence-based here at DeRote, we felt it was critical that we got our older adults comfortable with technology. So next slide, please. So um, within our Connect Through Tech program department, we operate a few different programs. The one I'll focus on in my um, additional comments here is our one-to-one -one tech coaching program that um, operates with support from the Samuels Foundation here in New York. Um, and that is a program that matches older adults with specially trained volunteers for ongoing uh, uh, tech help. We have launched what we call our Living Well Digitally Zoom series. Um, and these are um, webinars that are not uh, about teaching older adults technology, but rather getting them excited about technology. We know there's enough terrific content out there and people that are putting out lots of um, uh, video-based tech training specifically geared to, or, towards older adults. The purpose of this series is to introduce older adults to new ideas. For instance, just last month, we did a a uh, special webinar on robotics and older adults and got them excited and did some live demonstrations. It's a lot of fun. Um, we are um, moving into program scaling um, of our tech coaching program and with a grant from the Consumer Technology Association Foundation, we are working with the Village to Village Network um, and helping them launch tech coaching within the villages. We're working with four villages now. Um, our University Without Walls program, um, we talk about technology, but the telephone still is technology. We remind people of that. We still have within our constituents um, landline users um, who are not um, quite ready or able to cross the digital divide. So we have a very vibrant teleconference program, which we've run for 40 years, where older adults gather on teleconference calls for programs. Oh, I lost my PowerPoint. Um, okay, I have it up on, let me just. And um, we do other fun stuff um, as well with our Connect Through Tech department. For example, we are, um, we've been doing some user design work with involving older adults in focus groups. Um, Tomorrow, we've got a group of 20 older adults that is join, going to join a classroom at the University of Illinois um, in their robotics class to talk to students about their needs in, as older adults and um, give input. Um, and so we find uh, we do corporate tech events here at DeRote um, where companies can come in with their tech savvy employees and help our older adults with specific problems. So do, do we do a range of other things. Okay, next slide, please. So um, pre-COVID, our program was offered in homes um, or at our offices here at DeRote. Um, and I loved what Tyler earlier said about the development of intergenerational relationships. And that is certainly our, our not so hidden agenda when we do one-on-one -on -one tech help. Um, when we were doing this in the home pre-COVID, we were really focusing on these longer term coaching relationships, going at an older adult's pace, whatever that pace might be. Um, it was menu driven with specific topics that and competencies that we asked them to cover. They could go as slow or as fast as they wanted to. And sometimes they'd just spend the time chatting about other things, which was lovely too. So next slide, please. Uh, during COVID, oops, go back one more. There we go. Um, during COVID, we had to very quickly pivot. Um, not so easy. We shifted over to offering our one-on-one -on -one tech coaching by phone or, um, and optimally uh, if we get the older adult going on Zoom with Zoom and screen sharing. Um, our, um, the, we uh, helped 260 clients in the, in the first year of COVID. Um, the benefit of this was that we were able to attract a volunteer core well beyond New York, and we were able to help older adults well beyond New York and well beyond our catchment area here uh, in Manhattan. 
Um, and we responded to many, many single requests for help. And the biggest one, of course, was help me get on Zoom. And I think within the first few months, we probably did, did um, 300 help sessions getting older adults up and running on Zoom as programming for older adults, group programming switched to Zoom. Okay, next slide, please. Right. Okay. And our volunteers. I know this is supposed to be about intergenerational relationships, but I do want to point out that we do have volunteers of all ages. We have college students. We have uh, young professionals, and we have some older adults who are marvelous tech coaches. Uh, I think there's something very comforting about opening your door and finding somebody somewhere near your own age coming in to show you technology. Um, so that has been a beautiful addition. Um, the commonality is that all of our uh, volunteers are trained in best practices for teaching tech to late, late tech adopters. So we give them special strategies and tools to sit down with older adults and do this work. And the most important strategy is don't take the phone or the computer away from them. Let them do the driving. Um, and um, we at one point in one of our sessions, we had to ask the volunteer to sit on his hands so that he would stop pulling the phone away and trying to do things for the older adults. So we're very, very focused on how older adults learn best. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, our challenges ahead. Um, uh, we would love to expand the program's capacity and geographic reach. You know, we love the fact that Consumer Technology Association Foundation is helping us spread this to the villages. Um, we're giving them some tools and, and tricks and models that will that are working well. We'd like to do more of that. The biggest challenge that we face in program expansion and getting more adults comfortable with technology is the affordability of broadband and um, devices for low income older adults. So I, it's really exciting to hear that there are programs that receive funding to pro provide those devices. Um, and we're really um, very challenged by teaching tech to older adults who are experiencing vision loss, have hearing impairments, have limited mobility, have cognitive um, challenges, have uh, manual dexterity, and many of the um, um, challenges that, that some older adults face as they get older. So we are looking for ways to solve those challenges. And next slide, please. And just a few very fun things that people have told us about both during COVID and after. I'm stuck at home, using my phone is the only way to stay connected to the real world. I feel more confident going to my intergenerational program over Zoom ever since working with my volunteer. I'm so grateful to her. For someone like me, an 82-year-old without experience in the world of electronics and living alone in New Jersey, isolated by family, you have given me a gift. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this experience has helped me to be more comfortable with the technical stuff and my sense of you can do this, give it a couple of tries and not get so scared. So, and next slide, please. And just thank you for giving us all this opportunity to present. Um, I thank you to our supporters and of course our wonderful volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I appreciate I appreciate your presentation and I noticed some of your longtime volunteers are listening today. So uh, maybe they wanna send in some comments, encouraging everybody else if you have questions to start putting them in the chat. Um, while I introduce Rachel from Linkages. Uh, Linkages is a very unique collaborative uh, that, um, that is, in, is committed to addressing social isolation and loneliness. Um, and they provide a lot of support to their members. And I know we're a little short on time from the tech glitches. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to describe Linkages. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, thanks, Kim, for that intro, and, and thank you all, um, I, especially to Grantmakers in Aging, appreciate this opportunity to be able to come and share about linkages. Um, as, as Kim said, we, we also consider ourselves to be a special collaborative. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, we were founded in 2018 um, to address social isolation, loneliness, and ageism across ages. 
And as you can see, our founder, uh, who passed away last year, but really set the cornerstone um, for linkages, describes that as being about meaningful connections. And that is really what we have based linkages on as we've, as we've grown it. Um, next slide. We created linkages as a supportive backbone model which means that at the center was a collaborative or is a collaborative of organizations um, that are committed to what we had described before, addressing social isolation and doing that through intergenerational programming. We added the supportive backbone because research has shown, and in our experience, we've also lived it, that there are some common barriers to intergenerational programming, as I'm sure my colleagues uh, who presented previously can attest to as well. There's about three or four of them. And what we often find is that those barriers can literally just stop a program from happening. And so we created linkages with built-in support, and the support looks like, I'll go through specifics here in a second, but essentially coaching and evaluation to whenever there's a barrier, help get through it. But our goal was not just to remove the barriers, it's also to build the capacity of organizations to develop and offer more high quality intergenerational programming. So this isn't about handholding, this is about building up. Um, and we very intentionally grew slowly. So we started in Metro Denver uh, with a collaborative of multi-sector organizations that included nursing home, affordable housing provider, social services providers, and institutions like the Denver Public Library and the Denver Art Museum, and have grown, like I said, very slowly in our first five years so that we could test this hypothesis that if we provide the resources and the technical assistance and flexible funding for programming, could we build the capacity of organizations? Could we increase the number of programs? And could we also increase the awareness of the benefits of intergenerational programming? In our first five years, we've offered 34 programs. Year over year, the number of programs are increasing with over a thousand participants ages five months to 96 years. So our metrics are tracking with our hypothesis. Next slide. So when we say technical assistance and coaching and what are those barriers, those barriers are very much, this won't be surprising, but partnership is a key one. It's very, very challenging for an organization who focuses on older adults to partner with an organization who focuses on youth. Oftentimes we have different metrics, different uh, goals, different funding sources, different languages that we're using. Um, and so this has been a key part of what we do and has actually been, I think the greatest return on investment, honestly, of linkages is watching the expansion of partnership and watching our organizations increase confidence, which they relate back in an evaluation we do every year to actually partner with others. Um, we also have provided a lot of training and capacity building around evaluation. One of the technology pieces that we've been employing um, just in this last six months is building a, a evaluation video training series. So our, we understand that it's there's a stigma, there's a fear around evaluation and data and metrics and all the big technical words. And so part of that building capacity is breaking that down. How do we make it easier? How do we make it fun so that we can actually look at our programs and our initiatives like linkages and tell whether we're actually having an impact? And then at the center here, you can see the technology piece. And that's really obviously what we wanna focus on today, but how we've used technology in addition to those video trainings to not only help with our programming, but also scaling of linkages. You can go to the next slide. And so this is where we are today. Uh, we, as we, as I said, we evaluate everything. We evaluate the individual programs that are offered by those member organizations of the collaborative and we evaluate linkages itself. And we became aware very quickly that our table, which was a physical table back in 2018 um, and became a virtual table as many of ours did in you know, 2020, was growing quickly. And I would get requests from around the country, from organizations from all different sectors, from long-term care to housing to parks and rec, all wanting to do intergenerational programming. They'd looked at a list of programs, maybe wanted to try to replicate one, and we're essentially just saying, can we just be part of linkages? You guys are providing the coaching and the technical assistance. You're providing the opportunity to partner and get to know other peers. Um, how do we do this? 
And so last year in 2021, we were very fortunate to receive uh, funding from the Next 50 initiative, um, which has made our scaling up possible. And this is where technology is absolutely at the center of it. What we decided to do just as we have grown slowly is not to just scale the mountain all at once. It's to take small steps, test it, learn from it and keep going. And so what you can see here is one example of where technology and similar to what my colleagues have presented, so I won't spend too much time on this, but how we use technology to help adapt the programs during COVID. Uh, the program on the left was a music therapy program, still going on now, started off in person, shifted to using tablets, uh, involves nursing home residents, preschool age children and their primary caregiver. So who you can maybe see on that tiny screen is a preschool age child um, and their, their parent. Um, and that happened, that's a weekly program still going on. Um, another example where technology has been absolutely critical in scaling is a program called Unboxed, which brings together teens and older adults who identify along the LGBTQ plus spectrum. It's a six week arts program that we offered virtually uh, last year in the fall, and now we're offering it in person so we can learn about the differences, like I said, and linkages we learn. And then we're gonna do it again online in the spring because we're getting requests from literally all over the state for folks that want to participate in this program. And I absolutely anticipate that's going to continue to be offered both in person and online um, using a variety of different um, technology modalities. Next slide. And perhaps the piece that I am most excited about and that I wanted to spend my last three to four minutes on is this hub. So as we built linkages, and like I said, we've been getting requests from around the country to be part of it. We were very aware of the fact that our resources were really focused on in-person. So that technical assistance, all that coaching I was talking about, finding partners, developing programs, doing marketing and outreach, evaluation, using data, it was very, very hands-on. Um, it was my team uh, who was doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings or trainings in the linkages program, uh, linkages meetings. But that is very difficult and very expensive to replicate with that much hands-on. And so we came up with this idea um, to create an online hub that from the front will look like a website. So it's a, an entry point um, where we will continue to build similar to what we have right now with stories of connection and talking about available programs and having a calendar and you know really um, recruitment and all of that. But behind that um, will be a dynamic hub where you will be able to log in um, and enter a variety of different rooms. Our goal here was to scale up using our special sauce, which is that wraparound approach to removing those barriers. And we really wanted to ultimately be able to reach organizations across the US um, and hopefully beyond who are in many ways replicating what others are doing. They're trying to reinvent the wheel, trying to do a, a similar technology program like Dorote was talking about to, um, you know, it's, it's essentially like you don't need to reinvent it. We have all these amazing organizations who can help each other, just like we've seen happen in the Linkages Collaborative. And so this hub will have resources available there. So we're right now, Next50 is um, funding the development of several toolkits, which for us, toolkits are customizable. It's not a program in a box that you just take to any community. It has a lot of guidance on how to customize it and figure out if it's right for your community. We also are in the process of developing a variety of quick guides around various aspects of intergenerational programming and sharing how to use evaluation. Um, those are just sort of the beginning of, of the resources that will be there. We will also have those places to connect. And this is where, as I was talking about our various programs, we have another called Photography and Memory that brings together undergraduate students and older adults in the community to, through, photo, through photographs, being able to share life stories, create new stories together and get to know each other. They're always asking to stay connected. This will have rooms similar to like a Facebook group where you can continue to stay engaged, continue to stay connected, and you can also use it during the program. So they could have little assignments, they could be able to share a photograph and reflect on it with each other. We will also have areas on there for our trainings, both live and asynchronous or recorded trainings, similar to that evaluation video series I was talking about. 
And then also areas for coaching. And that's that technical assistance where we will have office hours available. So anybody can pop in, we can learn from each other and we'll also have an expert in the room. And then we'll also have a dynamic frequently asked questions area. There's a lot of uh, consistent questions that are asked around this, but essentially this is what's going to help us take, take this field, we believe, to the next level and also be able to hopefully get a little bit more efficient and not reinventing the wheel in all these different um, communities and learn from each other and have all the resources in one place and also a lot of that, that hands-on um, support. So I know I'm at time, so I'm gonna stop there and hand it back to you, Kim. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, we'll have the next slide and I'll pull up, ask Chris Lemon to join me on video. Um, we, Chris, uh, Chris is the funder of the Digital Connecting Corp and from the Arbor Area Community Foundation. And we've invited him to talk a little bit um, with us today as from a funder's perspective. And Chris, you probably heard me call you a cheerleader earlier, and I hope that was okay with you. I didn't clear it first, but I really couldn't think of a better description for your role in that program. Um, so can you spend just a few minutes helping describe why I might have called you a cheerleader um, <laughs> and what's so special about this, how you got involved, um, and why you're such a vocal champion. No, absolutely. And and cheerleader, I think, is probably the best word. Um, <clears throat> and asking me to do this in a couple of minutes is going to be incredibly hard, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it my best shot. Coming on, you know, coming or traveling through the pandemic, we all knew that um, technology was going to be, uh, the use of technology and then also the trainings around it was going to be incredibly important to deal with social isolation, quality of life, access to, you know, things like healthcare, um, loved ones, you name it. And as a funder, I think one of the reasons why I was so drawn to this was that in, in the midst of the pandemic, we are looking for like those band-aid solutions, things that we can implement right now because it was absolutely needed in that moment. It was an emergency response. But at the same time though, we're also trying whenever possible to identify opportunities that can provide an immediate, but then also a long-term impact in this particular space. So not something which is just temporary. Um, and not placing value on either or is just if you can do both, then fantastic. And so what really what really drew me to this particular one, and I'm going to do a little bit of a plug for GIA here, you know, it's been, having been a member of GIA for so many years, and you, you learn about all the different um, issues um, and hurdles and opportunities um, for supporting older adults. It helps you to look for, for um, lots of different options when you are developing a grant program or you're looking at applications that are submitted. And this is a this is a classic example of where a lot of those learnings through GIA engagement um, really kind of helped to, to guide our decision making. You know, this was one that um, not only provided you know devices, which we knew was going to be important, um, not only provided the trainings, which was also important, but there's also there, there's a couple other things which I think really make this a home run. Um, one is the intergenerational aspect, which I think is great. Yes, we know that intergenerational programs are highly successful. But I was viewing this more in terms of um, the potential around workforce development with, uh, through a gerontological lens. Um, if, if those who are going through their schooling never have the opportunity to, to work with older adults in that space, then they may never know that that is an area that they are called to or that they enjoy, that they find you know, naturally builds upon their own personalities and talents. And so providing them an opportunity to, to work with older adults in this space, even if their, their major isn't technology, right? Um, they could be an MSW, you name it, but it's the opportunity to take a subject matter and to work with older adults in their space um, to help them understand you know, what's possible, um, to really encourage the growth and, and celebrate wins. That for me is a huge plus because we we know that there that the gerontological workforce is um, you know those with that focus is not booming right and we need to find ways to um, to really encourage individuals to look into that particular area as an opportunity for them so that was a huge plus I mean but the other part of it too is looking um, you know as we're looking or as we were looking for opportunities to fund in this space the. The opportunity to work with an organization that has the capacity to potentially scale was huge as well. Because um, we were funding lots of programs similar to this all across Washtenaw County, but not necessarily had that potential to really scale long-term. 
And by having this be, you know, a part of the university, you know, a part of their programming, what you have now is um, an influx of students every year who can plug into this particular program um, differently than, than other organizations may have, right? If it's a smaller nonprofit organization, which is dependent solely upon volunteers, you know, you could have an up year for volunteer engagement and you could have a down year, which means on those down years, that program may not deploy or it may have to scale back a lot. This is an opportunity for us to, to partner with university systems um, who have that influx of students every year. So there's this a much greater opportunity to have that consistency as the curriculum is now embedded within these programs, the students can plug into it, be a part of it, and then hopefully that influences them to then consider working in that particular field moving forward. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is this, and, and this is the, um, I think one of the hardest parts as funders is that you see, um, and I think any organization in the for-profit, private, doesn't matter, how important staff and leadership is in this space. Um, I have been lucky enough to work with, um, with Eastern Michigan um, on multiple fronts, same thing with University of Michigan. Um, and I knew when this application came across my desk, <laughs> excuse me, I already knew a bunch of the players. Um, and I knew going into it that we had dynamic, fantastic leadership that was going to drive this forward. You know, as a foundation, we we try to position ourselves as partners in the work. So sometimes we're, we're funders, sometimes we're thought partners, you know, sometimes we're trying to help address capacity issues to allow a program to move forward, to scale, whatever that may be. Um, you know, working with Tyler and then um, Decky Alexander, who is not on the call today, I knew going into this that all, all I really had to do was to fund it and they were going to take it and run with it. And then I met Dr. Jones and was like, oh my God, like this is just going to go places. And so um, I can't stress enough how important the identification of strong leadership is in these particular opportunities. Um, other programs that we funded that... Um, where the leadership, it, maybe it was just too much for their capacity. It didn't go much beyond the funding, but this is something, this particular program is one where leadership is absolutely committed. They've seen the opportunity, they've seen the outcomes, and they are looking for a way to make this alongside of, of the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation to, <clears throat> excuse me, to scale this countywide. And that is, that is such a huge plus right there. Um, and so I know that we can't always create dynamic leadership, um, but in, once you identify it, you know, you, you really have to go all in because you just know the chances for success are just going to be incredibly high. And so that's what we've been very blessed in this particular, um, with this particular opportunity as well. Um, the last thing I'll say, I have no idea where I'm at with my time right now, but I'm going to, I'm going to go rogue and I'm just going to say one more thing. Um, I had, I had an opportunity to, to do a site visit. Um, and I, I have to tell you, it was absolutely magical. Um, I walked into a space, you know, tail end of COVID, <coughs> room is packed with older adults. Um, they are, they were listening during the, the learning session. This had to do with it, um, connecting your devices to a Bluetooth speaker or a Bluetooth device. I was watching them engaged not only with the teachers, or that well, the students who were teaching the curriculum, but I also watched the older adults empowered in that space to start helping each other. So I saw one individual who was struggling, someone from another table came over, not, and we had one of the older adults present, and started teaching this individual how to do it and help them out. So the, the older adults who were there, who understood the material, like if it was week two, so it was a repeat session, <clears throat> they were looking for people to help. And so your, your, your staff went from four to like 20. Um, and within that two hours that I was there, I probably have like seven or eight stories um, that could really just kind of show um, how impactful this was. Um, but I'll share those at another time. But, um, you know, I just really, yes, I am a cheerleader for this. The players that are there, the, the blueprint for the program itself, so many things just came together. Um, and I'm really excited to see where this goes moving forward. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I hope that, um, well, if we want to advance to the next slide, I hope that all the funders understand that this is why we only invited one representative of a funder for these programs, or we would have needed an entire week-long seminar. Um, but I appreciate the comments. It tied a lot together of our important best practices. 
I'd like to invite all of the panelists back onto video um, so we can start to answer some of the questions. Yes, we are over time, um, but some of them I want to invite you to respond directly in the chat when they're easy questions to answer. We'll share contact information um, and the very last slide so everyone will be able to have an opportunity to connect directly with some of the specific questions. Um, I wanted to gather a few of them. We talked a lot about responsiveness in terms of what the needs are of the older adults, in terms of what the needs are of the program partners. Um, I want to turn that over to see there were a couple questions about training. I'm not sure we covered. Um, how are your programs responding to the needs of the participants who want to be a part of them, but maybe don't know how or don't have the tools yet to do it? Um, maybe I can turn it over to the EMU team briefly to talk about how you're working with the students that cycle through every semester or year, and then um, and then we'll see how we are with time. <laughs> Let's start there with training for the students. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll briefly say that our students are offered um, some specific virtual training programs or modules that they go through and then they have a quiz that they respond to afterwards that we check in with. And those modules, they focus on communication with older adults, technology, ethics, um, ageism and addressing ageism within one's own self. Um, and then we talk about accessibility also, and we try to get them more familiar with the aging process in general too, so that they can be more informed with um, who they're we're going to be working with and the different types of experiences that these people might be going through as well. Dr. Jones, do you want to expound upon that with, from the OT side and things? So our particular program it has a developmental sequence. So our students actually have a semester that they are learning about older adults. So they get a chance to really see that in person outside of the textbook of how individuals can respond to, to certain things. And also once the students receive the training um, weekly, we do have weekly meetings myself with the students and I have them find what evidence is out there pertain pertaining to um, technology right now. So they they do get a lot of hands-on collaborative and a lot of it is in the in the moment too that they're learning because they have come back to us with certain things a lot of times like maybe we should adopt this because we're seeing this from our participants and so they get to turn on that intergenerational hat but they also get to wear that clinician hat as necessary as well. Thank you. That was I hope that's helpful toward answering very complicated questions. Um, to answer the other half of the question that I've seen pop up a lot in the chat has to do with the responsiveness to the variety of needs older adults have when it comes to language, accessibility. Um, I'd love if Ellen wants to say a few words um, from Dorote having deep experience working with an older and frailer population um, and very diverse population. How, how do you respond to those needs? Well, that, that's a work in progress, and, and you've identified a, a definitely one of the challenges we're working on. I think what we're finding is that we need to do additional training with the volunteers. We need to encourage them to keep up on accessibility features uh, that are embedded in the technology. We've got some volunteers that kind of specialize in certain areas. We say, hey, you know, we let the, the volunteers kind of select from a list of available older adults, and we give them a little snapshot about what that person's tech needs are and their challenges are, so they kind of self-select. Uh, we're finding some volunteers are gravitating towards, hey, I, I know the accessibility features. I'll take that older adult who's experiencing vision loss. Um, but it is an ongoing challenge for us to keep up with the, the changes in the field of technology and to really meet older adults' needs. Um, our, our motto is work where the older adults is at with the volunteers. We train them much more in process rather than tech features. Um, and so if somebody needs something repeated for them, practice, we encourage practice to have the volunteers text them or email them during the week so they can practice that feature um, and encourage them to use technology um, throughout their lives um, just to just to stay current and on top of it. Thank you. 
Um, a few of the other questions have to do with best practices and sharing and some logistical questions about linkages. Um, I want to just turn it over to Rachel for a moment so I don't overpromise how people can be in touch and get involved um, with some of the logistical questions of what you're building, how, and maybe to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ab email me is probably the, the easiest way, but if you go to our website, which we included the link, there's a, a little place for there to contact us. I'm happy to go through any of the logistical stuff. I did answer a couple of the questions that were already in the Q&A about the platform and whether we're translating. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to to talk to anyone uh, or, you know, so just send me an email and we'll set something up. But yeah, always happy to share. We're, we're very transparent and good sharers of information. Thank you. Um, and another very specific question that'll be the last one I'll answer um, in this context has to do with about affordable devices. Um, I did want to share that, that is a, there's a lot of answers that deserves its own webinar and you should keep your eye on GIA uh, announcements because this is really a banner year when it comes to digital inclusion programs that will support older adults as one of the covered populations. So you might have heard of the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, that's a federal program to lower the cost or make the cost even free for devices and internet connectivity for older adults. There are a number of nonprofits that offer low cost devices to nonprofits and to individuals um, and, and refurbished devices and unthrottled internet and all of that. So we'll compile a lot of these resources there. Uh, those examples are mobile citizen, PCs for people. Um, they all cover different areas and there's just going to be more of that available this year. So I wanna make sure that we plug you in and that also you do a little research to find out who's working on digital inclusion in your communities um, to see who's sitting at the table that's doing the planning for the funds that are coming for that and make sure you and the older adults you represent are represented at those tables. Um, they are growing as well. And we wanna make sure they're not overlooked um, in light of COVID just because of the ageism that older adults cannot learn or use technology. We know that's not true. I promise you after decades, it is not true. In fact, it's easier to teach an older adult how to do anything tech than it is to teach a younger person to be a good coach. So I really wanna thank the panelists for their investment in something so special. Um, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanna turn the microphone back over um, to the GIA team to talk about some of their upcoming announcements, um, to thank them so much. I hope that you saw how these programs at least a snapshot demonstrate some of the very best practices in intergenerational work. Um, and I encourage you all to get involved in this space. It's exciting and there's so much of an open new frontier uh, in work and aging and with younger people in the workforce to solve challenges we have. Um, so we can go to the next slide or even the final slide for Emily. Oh, um, we can put that back at the very end, maybe you're welcome to contact us. We knew there wasn't enough time um, and there are some questions that have gone unanswered, but we are here for you. So please feel free to reach out. And with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. And thank you, Emily. Well, thanks so much, Kim. And thank you to all of our panelists. And I do want to apologize for the tech issues. Uh, we will be making the slides available to everyone. So we'll make sure to send those out along with the recording and additional um, responses to the questions that we didn't get to. So thanks everyone for bearing with us. I do want to also thank our supporters of this webinar, which include the CTA Foundation, Next 50 Initiative and RRF Foundation for Aging. If you are a funder and you're interested in getting involved in our aging and technology funders community, please reach out to me. We'd love to have you engaged in more conversations like this uh, going forward. I hope you'll join us next time. Uh, we will have a webinar on November 15th at two o'clock. And this is part of our um, dementia webinar series that we're doing in partnership with Bader Philanthropies. Um, so you can find out more information about this webinar on our website, and um, we hope you'll join us for this. Please follow us on social media. We um, share a lot of information about what our members are doing, but also, um, hot topics and aging through all of our social media platforms. So we hope you'll follow us. Um, and lastly, thank you all for being with us. Thank you for engaging in this conversation today. We hope you'll join us again soon for another GIA uh, webinar. And uh, take care, everyone, and be well. Thank you.